So glad that you're here today. Let me invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of John. John chapter 10 is where we'll be spending our time this morning. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Uh, while you're finding your place, though, just do a quick poll of the audience. Is, uh, is there anybody in here who's ever been tent camping? Tent camping. All right, very good, very good, all right, all right. Now, that was pretty much everybody with a few exceptions. Now, of those of you who have gone tent camping, how many of you really love tent camping? It's about what I figured. About what I figured. About, about, about one-third of you need counseling. That's pretty much what that means. Now, uh, now if, if you have never been tent camping before and would really like to try it, let me know. we got tents you can borrow. We're probably not going to use them again. Uh, I'm just kidding. We, we will, I guess, when it's cool. But uh, tent camping can be lots of fun for a couple of nights, right? And then after that, it's, well, it's kind of like being homeless. I mean, it's, it's pretty much what it's, it's like. It's, you're just sort of out there in the elements uh, with not a lot of protection from, from anything. Um, all, those, all those labels on it that say, you know, tape scenes, waterproof. It's a lie. It's a lie. I'm just, just telling you up front. Uh, they don't protect you from the cold. They don't protect you from the heat. They don't protect you from the wind. And, and one thing that we discovered on one of our camping trips is it doesn't protect you from wildlife either. Uh, we, we went down on the farm many years ago when the kids were, were a lot smaller and, and we set up our tent out in the middle of the field and and I was actually sleeping pretty well, which is a bit of a, a shock because most nights, the first night in a tent, you don't sleep hardly at all. And then the second night, you're so exhausted, you can sleep through a tornado. I mean, that's pretty much how it goes. But this first night, I was sleeping pretty well, and about 1 o'clock in the morning, I think it was, Lisa elbows me in the ribs, and she says, Did you hear that? And I'm thinking, you know, the walls are like that thick. You can hear everything. What, what was it I was supposed to hear? You know? She says, Listen. Well, I did. I didn't hear it. And all of a sudden, down in the, down in the woods, you hear this, this buck that's down there. And he apparently kind of caught our scent and snorted and pawed the ground a couple of minutes. What was that? I said, well, it was, it was a deer. Can it get in here? <laughs> if it wants to. <laughs> so that was a pretty short camping trip. But nevertheless, camping... Uh, the one thing that we've learned by taking a couple of extended camping trips, a couple of things we learned by taking extended camping trips, A, extending camping trips are not a good idea. That's one thing we learned. Uh, the second thing is taking an extended tent camping trip will really make you appreciate your house. If you think your house is small, go live in a tent for about eight days. And you'll be amazed at how big your house is when you come home. And how clean it is and how clean you feel when you get out of a shower. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing to help you appreciate it. Well, in some ways, that's what I want us to, to, to do spiritually this morning. I want us to, to drill down into our memory and hit that little pocket that reminds us of what it was to be lost. Because in many ways, to be lost, to be separated from Jesus Christ, is much like what it is to be spiritually homeless. You, you, don't, you don't have a home. You don't have a place to belong. You don't have anybody taking care of you. You don't have anybody watching out for you. But in this passage of Scripture, Jesus lays out for His people, the flock of God, what it's like to have Jesus as your good shepherd. So let's take a, take a minute and read through the text. Would you stand with me this morning as we read verses 1 through 18 of John chapter 10? The Word of God says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice." Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. 
Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go out and in and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my, my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received from my Father. Let's pray together. Father, help us this day as we look upon the ideal good shepherd, the model shepherd, help us to appreciate what Jesus has done for us. Help us to see the immensity of the love of God and the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God and the care of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. For in all these things we seek to bring Him glory and we ask His blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. All right. Uh, we're going to bring up a picture of a sheepfold now. It's just a little rectangular enclosure there. Go ahead and roll to the next one. Thank you. Uh, this is an artist's rendering of a sheepfold. A sheepfold. Now, this would be a place at night where uh, sometimes many flock of sheep would come to, and they would, they would rest during the night inside this little construction. And most of the time it would be built out of rock, uh, if it was a more permanent structure, sometimes out of wood. If it was a bit more uh, temporary, they might just build it out of, out of thorns and thistles and weeds. And it was something to keep the sheep in, and it was something to keep the predators out. And you'll notice is the way that this sheepfold is constructed, there's only one door. And it's down here at the bottom. And you, if you can see it, you can see the shepherd who is reclining at the door uh, into the sheepfold. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, that was to make sure that nothing could get to the sheep unless it got past the shepherd first. That's the shepherd putting himself between danger and the sheep. It also meant that the sheep couldn't wander off without jumping over the shepherd first, and that would wake the shepherd up, and he could reach out and bring them back in. So a sheepfold was, a, was an enclosure that was made to keep the sheep safe at night. Now, in the morning... In the morning, there may be, like I said, maybe several flocks of sheep that are enclosed in this that belong to several different shepherds. One of the shepherds would be the doorkeeper for the night. And in the morning, when it was time to take all the flocks out to find green pastures and still water and all those things that, that uh, sheep have to have, uh, the shepherd of this particular flock would step up to the door and he had a particular call that he would give. And his sheep were trained to respond to his voice, to respond to that call, and his sheep, and only his sheep, would follow him out. Everybody else's sheep would stay in until they heard their shepherd's voice. Jesus is using that illustration that all of the people that he was speaking to in this time and in, of history would have understood clearly, but uh, they didn't understand the spiritual application. That's what verse 6 means when it says, Jesus used this illustration but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. He was teaching them spiritual truth using something that they were familiar with. They understood the familiarity of, the, of how sheep work and how shepherding works, but they didn't understand the deeper meaning. So he goes on into verses 7 through 18 to begin explaining to them what this illustration is really all about. And he is making it very clear in verses 7 through 18, which is where we'll spend our time this morning, He's making it very clear that he alone is the rightful shepherd of God's flock. And that when he, as the good shepherd, calls God's flock, they hear his voice, they follow him. It's a picture of what it looks like to be rescued. 
It's a picture of what it looks like to be cared for by Jesus. It's a picture of what it looks like to be that lost sheep, that one that wandered off from the other 99 and, and have the shepherd come and find you and bring you home and dress your wounds and put you again into the sheepfold with all of the rest of the sheep in order that you can be protected, in order that you can have the guidance that you need, in order that you can be fed the way that you need to be fed, in order that you can be led in the right path. Sheep without a shepherd are a meal waiting to happen. Sheep without a shepherd are dinner for some wild predator just waiting to happen. Why? Well, because sheep aren't all that smart, are we? <laughs> sheep aren't all that, all that smart. Uh, they will be frightened by something and they will run and run and run and run and sometimes run themselves to death. Tending a, a flock of sheep was not a very lucrative means of living either. Uh, there, there's obviously not that many sheep farms around today, and while there were many more back then, it wasn't exactly a way to get rich unless you were the owner of a lot of herds and a lot of flocks. But if you were just a shepherd, you weren't going to make a lot of money. Furthermore, sheep were not all that easy to deal with. Sheep were kind of stubborn. And as stubborn sheep, they don't always want to go where they're supposed to go. They don't want to always eat what's provided for them. They don't always want to go back into the sheepfold at night. Sometimes they have to be led. Why would a, a person, why would a shepherd choose that kind of life? To be around stinky, smelly, stubborn, not-so-smart sheep all the time and not make much money for it. Why? Well, some people probably grew up that way. That's all they knew. That's all they could do. That was just the life that was handed to them. But the important question is really, why would Jesus, God's only begotten Son, why would He choose the illustration of a shepherd and sheep to describe Himself? Surely He's not some pauper who is a shepherd because he doesn't have any other choice. No, there's got to be something much more to it than just this is the only way that Jesus can make a living. That, that's, just, that's, not, well, that's just not true. What's going on here? Well, Jesus is using this illustration in order to communicate a truth, and that is that the reason the only begotten Son of God would leave heaven and come to this earth and take on human flesh and die in our place is not because it was just His duty. He came because of His love for God's people, the sheep. And that's why when you look at what's being pictured here and the salvation of God's people being rescued from all the danger outside and being brought in to God's family, the salvation of believers is primary evidence of God's love. The salvation of believers is primary evidence of God's love. I want to show you in this passage of Scripture four actions that the Good Shepherd takes that demonstrate God's love. Four actions of the Good Shepherd. You would discover this first one in verses 7 through 10. You'll notice that he begins to say, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the only way in. I'm the only way out. He goes on to say, All who ever came before me are thieves and robber, robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, he says again in verse 9. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will be delivered, is the idea there delivered safe and sound. Uh, he will go out and he will go in and he will find pasture. He will have all of the things that he needs. Jesus says twice, I'm the door of the sheep. In other words, he makes it possible for the sheep to find safety in the sheepfold. He is what closes up any access that predators have. He protects the sheep from the thieves, protects the sheep from predators. Um, and if you are outside of the sheepfold at night, then a good chance that you're going to not make it to see the sunrise. He makes it possible, on the other hand, for the sheep to leave the sheepfold and do so in safety because without going out of the sheepfold, they're going to starve inside the sheepfold. So there are dangers without, there are dangers within, and it is the shepherd that, that delivers all of the sheep in that same way. And Jesus says in that same way, with that illustration, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the door of the sheep. 
and I'm going to deliver my people from the dangers that are, that are found being outside, being disconnected from God's people, but I'm also going to deliver them from dangers that could, could be found by not being led. I'm going to do everything that is necessary to protect them from the evil one. Because verse 10 mentions the thief. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So the first action of the good shepherd is this. The good shepherd protects his flock. The good shepherd protects his flock. Now, sometimes we are afraid of the things that we do not understand. Sometimes we are afraid of the things that we can't see when we ought to be afraid of the things that we know are there. There was a little girl that was raised in Kansas and she was afraid of the dark and there was one place that she refused to go and she, that was the storm cellar. She would not go into the storm cellar because it was dark down there. She didn't have any idea what might be in that storm cellar. And even when her family would do tornado drills and her father would take her to the steps of the storm cellar, she would just lock those feet down and say, I'm not going. I don't know what's down there. But one day, a twister comes roaring through their town and Dad grabs up the family and they rush to the storm cellar. And just like all the other times, she, she locks those feet down and she says, Dad, I, I can't. I can't go down there. It's dark. I don't know what might be down there. To which he said to her, I know you're afraid of what might be down there, but you need to be afraid of what we know is out here. It's pretty good advice, isn't it? You need to trust me. You need to follow me and realize that I'm going to protect you. And the way that I'm going to protect you may not look all that safe to you, but I'm, I'm going to do it this way. Now, do you believe that Jesus can protect you? All right. And if you believe that He can keep you safe from all of the day-to-day -day physical dangers that we encounter, if you believe that He can keep you safe from all of the spiritual dangers that we can encounter, then can't He be trusted to get you through tough times that are less difficult than what Psalm 23 verse 4 calls the valley of the shadow of death? If, if we can trust Him to get us through that, then can we trust Him to get us through whatever it is that we're walking through now? Because He loves us, right? He loves us with an unyielding, relentless kind of love. He always has your best interests in mind. So trust Him. Trust Him. It doesn't have to make sense. You just need to trust Jesus. Follow Him wherever He leads, no matter how dangerous where He's leading may look. There's... There's, there's, a, there's a paradox in this that we all really need to understand. The paradox is this. There are times when God leads us places that don't look safe. When God asks us to do things that would seem to be dangerous. But let's think about who God is. Is there really a more dangerous place to be than anywhere that's outside of God's will? Well, let me spin that a different way. Is there a safer place to be than being right where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do? So if God is leading you to what appears to be a dangerous place or a, through a, a, the valley of the shadow of death, if God is leading you in that direction, then there is really no safer place then wherever it is God is putting you. Because God's there, right? Isn't that the way that verse concludes? And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for you are with me. Right? That's, that's the difference. It doesn't have, to, doesn't have to make sense to us. Because He's going to protect His flock. The Good Shepherd protects His flock. Now, somebody may be wondering, well, okay, but is there a limit to that? Is, is there a place where Jesus is going to cut and run? Where Jesus is going to say, okay, it's getting a little bit dangerous even in here for me, so you're on your own now, I'm going this way. Is that ever going to happen? No, no, and we know that. We know that because of what we find here in verse 11. 
He introduces himself, first of all, as the door in verses 7 and 9. Now in verse 11, he says, uh, as well as in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. Now, good doesn't just mean that I'm better than some other shepherds. That's not what that means. It literally means I am intrinsically good. I am beautiful. I am ideal. I am the model shepherd. That's what Jesus is saying of himself here. He, he's not at all saying that I'm just, I'm, I'm okay. He's saying, I am the person, I am the shepherd that all shepherds ought to be. That's what Jesus is, is doing. He's setting himself out there as a model. So what is it that the model shepherd does for the flock? Well, verse 11 answers that. I am the model, ideal shepherd. The ideal shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Is that what verse 11 says? The ideal shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 14. I am the ideal shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. We'll, we'll deal with that in just a minute. But if you look at verses 17 and 18, you'll notice there that my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Five different ways Jesus has made it very clear in these few verses that He is going to lay down His life for the sheep, that He is going to sacrifice Himself in order that the sheep can have life and have it more abundantly. Now that was really odd. That was a really strange thing for people in the first century to hear because in the Old Testament, it was always the sheep that were dying for the shepherd. The shepherd would have sin. The shepherd would have faults and mistakes in his life that had to be atoned for, and he would take one of his prized lambs to the temple, and there someone would kill the sheep in order that the shepherd might go on living. But now in the New Testament, Jesus calls himself the model shepherd, the ideal shepherd, the shepherd that all other shepherds ought to seek to be like, and he is saying here that he is going to give his life in order that the sheep might not just live, but that they might have life more abundantly. Now, don't miss it. Jesus did not die as a martyr. Jesus didn't die as a martyr. His death was not some tragic end to a well-lived life. Jesus voluntarily laid down His life so that others could live. Why would He do that? Well, because the Good Shepherd not only protects the flock, but the Good Shepherd cherishes the flock. The Good Shepherd cherishes the flock. The flock's more important to the shepherd, to the Good Shepherd, than the shepherd is to himself, which is the whole comparison deal with the hireling here. Verse 12 says, But a hireling, someone who's not the shepherd, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees danger, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. What, what happens here is when uh, the, the, the hired man, as it's called here, sees danger coming, well, the hired man sees danger and, and immediately thinks of themselves. And I'm going to protect myself, and I'm going to do so at the expense of the sheep. Jesus says, I'm not like that. That's the opposite of who I am. I'm willing to give of myself and give all of myself that the sheep that the sheep might have life and might have life more abundantly. That picture that you just saw, let's go back to that um, picture of the shepherd there. It's an interesting uh, picture. Um, yeah, just let that sink in for a minute. You see, there's a bear. I don't know what kind of bear that is, but I don't think it matters because it's a bear with teeth and claws. That's, that's, that's really what matters about a bear, right? And you can, you can obviously see that the bear is not all that friendly. The bear is not asking for the shepherd to scratch its nose. The bear is coming after the sheep, right? Now, where are the sheep? The sheep are on the other side of the shepherd. The picture could not be clearer. The shepherd puts himself between danger and those he's supposed to protect, right? And he's doing it with a stick. Now, maybe that's not the best anti-bear tactics. We could debate that. I'm just simply saying, this is what the heart of, of the Good Shepherd looks like. 
Jesus has placed Himself between the thief who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy and between you and me. And He has laid down His life so that we could go on living. I mean, this guy in this picture right here, this shepherd, all he's got to do is run away, right? And furthermore, he doesn't even have to be fast. He's just got to be faster than the slowest sheep. I don't know how many sheep he's got, but let's say there's 14. 14 minus 1, still 13. That's a pretty good day. Particularly if you get to live another day to tell all your shepherd buddies what happened. But that's not the heart of a shepherd. Certainly not the heart of the good shepherd who cherishes his flock, lays down his life to prove his love for us. Now, if he was willing to do that, I mean, just look at that picture again. If you're one of those sheep, assuming that this guy lives and survives the bear attack, would you, if you're one of his sheep, would you be more akin to trust him after he stuck himself between you and the bear? I would. I would. But if that guy takes off running and looks at the sheep and says, y'all on your own, I'm out of here. Well, I'm not sure you could ever trust that guy again. This is what Jesus does. This is who Jesus is. And we know it, right? We've seen Jesus do this. Jesus did this for us on the cross, right? This is who the good shepherd is. This is the heart of the good shepherd. If he will do that, and he does it out of his love for us, maybe we ought to trust him. Maybe we ought to trust him. I mean, what else does he need to do to prove his love to us? What else does he need to do to prove that he is trustworthy? Nothing. Because he cherishes the flock. And there may be somebody here this morning that may, that may say, well, all right, all right. But it, if he just knew who I was, if he knew what I did, he wouldn't cherish me ever again. Well, I've got some good news for you may not sound like good news at first, but if you look at verse 14, he says, I am the ideal shepherd, and I know my sheep. It doesn't mean that he can just recognize them. It doesn't mean he can pick them out of a crowd. It means that he knows them in a very deep and intimate way. He knows you and he knows me in such a way that, that is better and deeper than we even know ourselves. And in spite of the fact that He knows you, and in spite of the fact that He knows me, He still wants to have a relationship with us. Now, that's a mind-blowing thought when you think about it. He knows me. He knows things about me that you will never know. He knows things about me that I've yet to admit to myself. And yet, He still chooses, in spite of me, to love me. Why? Because He knows us. That's an evidence of His love. He protects His flock. He cherishes His flock. Thirdly, He, he knows His flock. And, but, and in spite of the fact that He knows His flock, He still desires to have that ongoing relationship with us. He knows us, and because He knows us, He has made it possible for us to know Him. Verse 14 again says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. We have the great privilege because of God's love for us and because of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf that we are able to enter into a relationship with Him and begin to understand who Jesus is through Bible study and prayer and walking with Him daily and seeing Him meet our needs. And if you've been walking with Him at any time whatsoever, have you ever found Him to be unfaithful? Has He ever left you? Has He ever forsaken you? No. And a thousand times, no. So... Why don't we trust Him? Let's trust Him. He protects. He cherishes. He knows. And lastly, let me give you this last one. He multiplies. The good shepherd multiplies his flock. Take a look at verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. The, this fold that he's talking about is, is really about believing Jews at the time. The gospel came first to the Jews as it was supposed to, and then from there it spread out to the ends of the earth. 
But it came first to the Jews. And Jesus said, at this point in history, the gospel has stayed with the Jews. And He has said of them, they're this fold. But there are other sheep that are not a part of this ethnic fold that are still going to become a part of the one flock. Again, look at that. It does not say that they will hear my voice and there will be another flock with another shepherd. It doesn't say that. It says they will hear my voice and there will be how many flocks? One flock. And how many shepherds? One shepherd. So in other words, Jesus is prophesying now. He's, he's foretelling what is going to take place when the gospel expands beyond the Jewish realm and goes out into the Gentile realm and that there will be people in the Gentile world, you and me, that are come, going to come to faith in Jesus Christ and we are going to be brought into God's flock. So how many groups of people are God's people? Just one. Just one. Well, now, wait a minute. I thought God dealt with the Jews and then God dealt with the Gentiles. Well, listen, listen. I don't think the Scripture could be more clear that God has one plan of salvation, that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that we are all grafted into the same root of the same tree, that there is one flock, that there is one shepherd, and we are all a part of the gospel that has been brought by the Savior, Jesus the Christ. Period. But He's multiplying His flock. It's not staying the same. It's getting bigger because there are other sheep that are out there that need to be brought in. Now, what, is that, what, is, what does that say to us? Well, it wasn't too far into the future when Jesus said these words. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right? What was He saying? He's saying, I'm leaving you here to carry out the multiplying work of going out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those that have yet to respond. And when they respond, disciple them, grow them, multiply the effort. And even today, the Lord is still bringing people into His flock. And even today, even 20 centuries later, He's still calling the church to go and make disciples. But our day is a day of pluralism. A day where we are told that there are many paths to God. But yet when you read this text as well as others, I am the door of the sheep, he says. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. But the implication is... Well, it's not really an implication because verse 8 says, All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. The thief comes to kill and steal and destroy. He says, I am the good shepherd. What is, he, what is he saying? He's saying that there is one and only one Savior. There is one and only one way of salvation. It's, it's not narrow to think that way. It's just reality to think that way. Let me give it to you this way. Suppose for a, a moment that uh, Lisa and I were not married. We weren't even engaged. We hadn't actually met each other face to face. Suppose that we had just been exchanging letters back and forth or email or, or instant messages back and forth and we had gotten to a place to where uh, we had grown fond of each other through that kind of correspondence and, and we decided it was time to meet face to face. Y'all follow where I'm going with that? Okay. So she's got in her mind this idea of what I look like. Okay? I don't exactly know what that looks like, but I'm pretty sure she would be disappointed when I showed up. Okay? Can you imagine that? You've waited all this time. You corresponded. You sort of fantasize about, whoa, this guy, what is he going to look like? He's going to be tall, he's going to be thin, he's going to have muscles, he's, he's going to look like Chris Helmsworth or something like that, you know. And all of a sudden, I show up. Can you feel her disappointment? I'm telling you, that would be rough. And then she looks at me and she says, oh, well, 
you know, I, I, I think it would just be better if we just went back to writing letters. Why don't you go back to where you came from and I'll go back to where I came from and, and we'll just write letters to each other. That way I can go on pretending that you look like somebody else. Well, how are we supposed to have a relationship now? Can that relationship, that relationship between the real me and the real her, can, can that relationship really go anywhere now? No, because I'm rejected. She's thinking about somebody else that doesn't really exist. Now do you see why when you understand that Jesus Christ, God, sent letter after letter through prophet after prophet, and then there came a day when it was time for the lost world and God to meet face to face. And Jesus came and took on human flesh and He announces Himself to the world and for the world to look Him square in the face and say, well, you're not exactly what we wanted. We, we would prefer that our God be like this or our God be like that. Or that you hadn't have said this was wrong, or that you should have said this was mandatory. Well, you see, what they've just done, if they've not rejected a path to God in favor of another path to God, they have rejected the only God there is. It's not narrow, it's not bigoted, it's not intolerant, it's reality. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the one Savior, the one Son of the one God that actually can save? You have a choice to make. And there's really only three things that you can do. The first one is to just reject Him outright. No thanks. I'll sit back and wait for somebody else to come be my Messiah. Well, that's never going to happen because He's the only one there is. Or you could say, well, I just don't think that today's the day that I really want to make that decision, so I'll just wait. Well, is that really any different than on, on the day that I show up at, at the door, she looks at me and says, uh, 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 let me think about it. It's still a rejection that day, isn't it? There's really only one choice really only one option and that option is to receive Jesus Christ for who He is and for what He's done knowing that He is the fullest expression of the love of the triune God for mankind. He is God in the flesh and there is no greater expression of God's love for you than the fact that Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, but Jesus has been raised. He has ascended back to the Father and He's coming again. His love for you is an unyielding, relentless, rescuing love. 